Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Katie Willey with Wanaskewan Heritage Park and the University of Saskatchewan will be speaking about the bison reintroduction at Wanaskewan. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. We will be hosting our next speaker series tomorrow. This will be in conjunction with the South of the Divide Conservation Action Program, or SODCAP, and their annual general meeting. The presentation by Diana Geekus from Environment and Climate Change Canada will feature what we know, or rather don't know, about badgers. And that's tomorrow at about 3 p.m. Save the date for our October Native Prairie Speaker Series. Andrew Didiak from the Canadian Wildlife Service will be speaking about Northern Leopard Frogs and Great Plains Toads. That's October 29th at 12 p.m. You can register for free for these webinars through the PCAP website. And all past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. This webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pembina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our bronze sponsors are Camp Wolf Willow, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance Inc., as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. And to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. We have over 50 people online, I think 100 registered, so everyone will stay muted for the duration of the webinar. Now a bit about today's presenter. Katie Willey is a graduate student at the University of Saskatchewan studying under the supervision of Dr. Ernie Walker. After completing her Bachelor's of Science in Archaeology at the University of Saskatchewan in June of 2018, she began working full-time at Wanaskewin, where she previously had done field work and worked for a summer. Working at the park, Katie developed and delivered tours focused on archaeology and the prehistory of the Plains, which is when she knew that she wanted to further study Plains archaeology in her Master's. Katie had always loved the history of Saskatchewan and has become very passionate about teaching the whole history, not just the past few hundred years, as there's so much more to the story. Outside of work and school, Katie is an artistic swimmer and has been involved with the local club for many years, coaching and swimming. Working at Wanaskewin has let her combine her love of teaching with her passion for archaeology and history into the perfect job. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Katie. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'm just going to get my presentation going here. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you all for tuning in. As Caitlin said, my name is Katie Willey, and I am a graduate student here in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan. And I am studying under Dr. Ernie Walker. Dr. Ernie Walker is one of the founders of Wanaskewan Heritage Park, and that is where I have been lucky enough to work for the past three and a half years, and I'm now writing my master's thesis about. Um, as an archaeologist, my interests lie in plains archaeology, especially specific to bison and the last like 6,000 years of history, and public archaeology where I have the opportunity to share and educate people about the archaeology that I study, so about the plains, and I also have a special interest in forensic anthropology as well, which is the science of archaeology and anthropology applied to law enforcement and um, courts and proceedings like that. So um, today I will be talking about bison restoration on the northern plains, and specifically the bison at Wanaskewin and how we have brought bison back to the park. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to Wanaskewin Heritage Park. It is centered around the Opimahau Creek Valley, a place that people have called home for over 6,000 years. So starting 6,400 years ago, 
uh, people began occupying the Okimaha Creek Valley and did so right up until the formation of treaties and the signing of Treaty 6 back in 1876. So for thousands of years, people came from all over the Northern Plains to live, to hunt, to practice ceremony right here in the Okimaha Valley. And as such, today we find a lot of archeology span sites. This valley, uh, once people stopped living here with the formation of treaties, it was homesteaded in 1902 by two families, the Penner family and the Witkowski family. So the valley was kind of split in half. And then in the 1950s, the Witkowski family came to have the whole valley as their property. Um, Mike Witkowski was the main rancher and he had an assistant who was named Ernie. And on weekends, they would go out and Ernie would help Mike with his cattle and help him take them through the valley. Now, um, with this, when they were out, Ernie, an archaeology student at the time, would be finding artifacts spread throughout. So he would find bison bones, he'd find charcoal, he would find arrowheads and dart tips and pottery. And not just in numbers like we find just scattered throughout the plains, they were in a very, very high concentration. And so he would talk about this, Ernie, and he'd mention it to the rancher, Mike, um, telling him how important this might be, must be and how many sites there would be there and how well lived in the valley had been. But he didn't figure Mike um, was listening all that closely until Mike went to retire. And this was around 1980. And when he wanted to retire, he told Ernie that he wanted to sell his land to someone that would protect it because he had been listening to Ernie talk for all those years. Um, and saw the value in the land. And so figured it needed to be protecting. He didn't want it sold and turned into a golf course or have um, houses built around it. He wanted it protected, which is one of the first miracles that have made Wanna Scale and what it is today. Ernie, having just completed his PhD, came back up to Saskatoon from Texas and started to work with Mike and the city of Saskatoon and the Muwasan Valley Authority to get Wanna Scale and started. Now, Elders and other people from local First Nations were also very involved in the formation of Wanuskewin, and we wouldn't be here today with the park, what it is without um, local Indigenous people um, having a very large part in what Wanuskewin does and how we operate. Ernie did a survey of the valley. So Dr. Walker surveyed the valley um, in 1982 and 1983 and identified 19 different pre-contact archaeology sites. So sites dating to before contact with Europeans. And they were mainly down in the flat areas of the valley. Um, with the elders, they decided to form a heritage park to protect the valley. And the elders said, we don't really know what you mean by heritage park exactly, but we want this protected to help teach future generations about what Wanuskewin is. Um, Wanuskewin was like a sanctuary. The Okimaha Valley was like a sanctuary on the Northern Plains. So the Plains region is here on this slide. It's kind of from about Edmonton and Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, all the way down through the middle of Texas with uh, the Rocky Mountains being the border on the west and the Mississippi River being the border on the east. And so it's this whole region. The Northern Plains would be Montana, North Dakota, Saskatchewan up in there, Saskatchewan, Alberta. So um, the Opimaha Creek Valley was a place that people came to from all over the Northern Plains. And we see every cultural group um, that existed on the Northern Plains from 6,400 years ago to present day living in the valley at some point. So with the elders in the 1980s, they formed Wanuskewin Heritage Park um, the city bought the land from Mike Witkowski and leased it to the park, and it is where we are today, and we opened to the public in 1992. And we've been open ever since, and in 2013, we wanted to start kind of renovating the park, starting to fundraise money to elevate it to the next level. and. Achieving UNESCO World Heritage designation was identified as something that would be really magnificent and make Wanuskewin like 
kind of level up, I guess, if you will. So we based our Thundering Ahead campaign, which is our campaign for UNESCO designation on four pillars, on um, the visitor center being a world-class site. So um, having exhibits and art galleries and a conference center and renovating it all. And so that's what we've been doing since 2017. We, the, another pillar was the archeology span site. So preserving them, um, continuing archeological research. And then uh, the third pillar was environmental protection. So preserving the valley, which you see here um, as a intact, um, really it's what we call an ecological island. So the biodiversity, the number of different plants and animals that live down in the valley is so much greater than on the plains that surround it. And so it's almost like an island on the plains. You won't find diversity like this in many other places, if at all. And that is why it is so special. And so we want to protect that. And the fourth pillar was bison. We wanted to bring bison back to the park. Bringing bison back is something that the elders back in the 1980s said would really complete the park and make it magnificent and complete the story of indigenous peoples here on the plains. So we brought bison back in December of 2019, but it was one of the goals of the Thundering Ahead campaign. So here is our building. You can see how big it is um, now, and behind that building is the Okemaha uh, Creek Valley, and the building itself is actually uh, built right on top of one of the two bison jumps, which is one of the ways people hunted bison by convincing a herd to run over the edge of a cliff. Um, it's built right on top of one of the two that are found within one escapement. Now, bringing bison back is obviously the part of our um, four pillars of the campaign that I'm going to be focusing on today. But to bring bison back, we needed to bring grasslands back. Um, and grasslands restoration efforts have been occurring across the plains for a long time now. In the foreground of this picture, kind of where that bison silhouette is, you'll see that it is grass, but it was once agricultural fields. And so these farms were crops right up until 2018 was the last year that we planted crops there. But in 2017 and 2018, Wanuskewin planted um, crops that would help condition the soil to make it better for grasslands restoration. And so in 2019, we were able to reseed over 15 different types of uh, native prairie grass seeds to these fields. And we reseeded three quarter sections of land to native prairie grass. So a picture of the grasslands here. Um, grasslands restoration has been really, really important since the entire grasslands biome nearly disappeared through the 1800s. The grasslands provide home to many different plants and animals. Um, animals like ferrets, foxes, weasels, wolves, bison, pronghorn, all called the grasslands home for many, many years before they started to be converted into agricultural lands. And so returning grasslands, um, it will return the habitat for all of these different animals. And unfortunately, some of them did face local extinction or complete extinction from um, the grasslands. So they we aren't able to bring them back today, but we're hopefully increasing the homes and the places where other animals that only face local extinctions can live in the future. And grasslands restoration needs to be done very carefully balanced. We need to make sure that the soil bacteria and nutrition and the elements in the soil are right, which is why we planted the crops that we did in 2017 and 2018 to help with that. We need to make sure the right insects are brought back as they help um, in the ecosystem in order for us to bring back um, the larger animals and ultimately bison. With the advent of agriculture and it expanding across North America, um, the grasslands ecosystem started to disappear very, very quickly and this was heightened, but it also increased, um, it was heightened by and increased the disappearance of bison from the plains. So bison are the keystone species to the grasslands and I'll go into that more in just a little bit. But with 
bison being overhunted and grasslands being converted. We had like the perfect storm for the grasslands ecosystem to nearly disappear completely. Um, grasslands of those that existed on the plains. So this entire region here would have been uh, grasslands pre-contact, so pre-agriculture here. Uh, it's less than 10% for sure. It may even be less than that. I don't know what current numbers are, but less than that is actually intact um, grasslands that have never been disturbed. Um, it, when a grassland space has been disturbed, it can never fully go back to what it was pre-agriculture, so pre-cultivation. So very, very few um, spaces have untouched, uncultivated uh, grasslands. And most of these spaces are found in protected and conserved areas. There are many in Saskatchewan, and there are also pastures kept on in different people's lands that are native prairie grass still that is intact and has never been cultivated. So from that, we are able to take the seeds and of the species of grass that are supposed to be on the land and that is how grasslands restoration is able to happen. So Juan Escaon was able to get the seeds of uh, over 15 different grasses to reseed the three-quarter sections of land um, at the park. This picture here is of Grasslands National Park, it's not of Juan Escaon, we don't have hills like that up here, but they. this is just to show you what grasslands um, would and should look like. What, why the grasslands are so important and why bringing them back is something that people are really working for today is because as an ecosystem, when they have those intact and well um, structured, their well structured root system, they're actually able to pull a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. And with climate change increasing and uh, global carbon emissions increasing, the carbon being pulled from the atmosphere and it, it can be stored underground in the grasslands helps mitigate the effects of climate change. And grasslands are actually able to do this better than other large ecosystems like, um, or biomes such as forests, boreal forests, rainforests, things like that. Because um, in the grasslands, their root system will go several meters into the ground, whereas an agricultural crop will only cover the first maybe foot or so of the ground. And the, there are so many different plants in a grassland system that there's so many different roots compared with the trees that are larger themselves, but there's fewer roots underground in the end. So that is the grassland restoration component of um, the presentation, but grassland restoration is important for bison restoration. So bison are the keystone species to the grasslands. They are the largest land mammal in North America. Male bison can weigh up to and sometimes over 2,000 pounds, female bison around 15, 1,700 pounds, um, and their heads alone can weigh around 500. So they are very, very large, but they are an animal built for the prairies. Um, their large size is to keep them warm in the winter. They've got a double um, coat of fur where their fur not only keeps them warm, but it also repels water, so they lose less heat through the winter. Um, they are very, very fast animals. When they're running at top speed, they can run at about 50 kilometers an hour, which is as fast as cars drive in the city. Um, they can, they are several meters long and several meters tall, and they can run for a very, very long time. While other animals may be able to run faster, bison, um, they don't really tire out once they're running, so they will be able to outrun other animals just based on the fact that they can keep going. So if an animal is chasing them, um, or if it was a race between a pronghorn and a bison, and maybe a pronghorn could run faster, but they will tire out very, very quickly. Bison have the lungs and the build to keep running for great distances, and this helps them survive and become the keystone species of the grasslands. Keystone species being um, one of the species of animals typically, but also plants that an ecosystem cannot survive without. So when bison are removed from the grasslands, the grasslands don't function as they should. So the grasslands need bison. What the bison do for grasslands is 
because they are so large, they need to eat a lot. So bison will eat between 30 and 50 pounds of grass every day. Um, they graze between nine and 11 hours every day. So they're eating a lot of grass and they prefer to eat grass because they need a lot of food as opposed to maybe higher nutrition, bushes and shrubs and leaves that way because they're not going to be able to find enough bushes to eat the leaves from. Um, so they eat grass and they'll just eat the sheer quantity of grass. So they can eat more than any other animal um, on the grasslands in a day. And this helps the grass keep growing. So it keeps um, from grass dying and then forming a dead layer of grass on the ground surface. And what this does is keeps new grass growing, right? So new grass can always be growing on the um, plains when they are being grazed by an animal like bison. Other animals that graze on the grasslands would have been pronghorn, deer, elk, um, and other smaller animals like rabbits, of course. As bison walk, their hooves are aerating the soil. So they turn up the soil a little bit with each step that they take. And this helps make sure that um, the soil is able to breathe and there's um, air being introduced into it. While bison travel, so they don't necessarily migrate in the typical north in the summer, south in the winter fashion like many birds do. Uh, they do travel, or they did at least, travel great distances. Um, across the plains each year. And this was seeking better forage, so better food, uh, finding better shelter. If it was a particularly cold and windy winter, you'd likely find more bison further south. Um, but they would also seek areas of shelter like valleys, such as Yopimahau Valley. Um, and while they're traveling, seeds and other like pollen are picked up by the hair on the bison's legs. And so you can see how bushy the hair is, especially on the front legs here. This is a bison shedding its winter coat. Um, and that will pick up the seeds and pollen, but also while they're eating, they're ingesting those seeds and pollen. So when they get to a new area, they're introducing and mixing those seeds with the ones there and they help maintain diversity in the um, plant uh, seeds and species that are in an area. And also while they're eating, they ingest them and then the new seeds come out in their dung and are introduced that way. Bison dung also acts as a fertilizer. And when bison do what's called wallowing, which is this, it's he, this bull here, he's getting ready to wallow. So he's going to lay down in the ground and try and scratch his back, rub off his fur on the ground. Um, and that's called wallowing. And when bison do this, they, if they do it in a spot repeatedly, which they tend to, they create a little depression in the ground and that depression can fill with water and form like a mini, like a micro ecosystem. So that'll provide a water source for smaller animals um, like birds and bunnies and uh, little rodents. And it also provides like a micro flora ecosystem. So different little algae and other water plants will thrive in this little um, puddle of water created by the bison wallowing. And that is really important to the grasslands. This is one of our animals that we have here at Wanuskewin. You can see the building in the background. This is our bull that we have. So in the 1800s, or I guess the reason why bison restoration is so important is because they don't exist just naturally in the wild anymore today. And we need to reintroduce them into protected and conserved areas so that we can have the number of bison increasing every year. We can't just let them roam out on the fields because out in the wild, I guess, because they will eat people's fields and that is their livelihood. And today our society, our world, we function in a world of agriculture. So we need the crops that are growing. And so bison, we can't just quite let them roam free right now, but bringing them back to those protected and conserved areas where they are able to graze on grasslands, which is their natural home, um, is increasing their numbers and it's increasing the spaces of grasslands. And the reason why bison have to be restored is because prior to contact with the Europeans, so I'm talking around the end of the 1700s there, there were, we estimate, about 30 million bison on the plains. 
And so remember that Plains region is the entire center part of North America, from Prince Albert down to um, middle of Texas. And with 30 million bison there, there was no shortage for people. For children, I always make the comparison, that's almost as many bison on the plains as there are people in Canada today. Just to put it in perspective, that is a lot of bison. And that was the number at the beginning of the 1800s, there was no shortage, people could live off of them. But through the 1800s and by the 1870s, uh, there were less than a thousand bison. So they were nearly decimated, bison nearly went extinct. And thanks to a few key people, especially in the United States that saw this happening, uh, the bison were protected and um, conserved. And that forms the basis of the present day herds. The ways bison were nearly lost and the reasons why um, their population numbers dropped so dramatically is a big part the fur trade era. So um, people were hunting the bison and over hunting them. They weren't hunting them sustainably like indigenous peoples had for thousands of years. And the furs were being sent back to Europe because with the industrial revolution, all of this new machinery had been created and bison hides, while thicker than other animals, they were large, they proved to be really, really good hides for um, all of this machinery to make the belts and everything for them. So that's a big reason why bison were overhunted. They were also hunted as a means of controlling the indigenous peoples. Um, settlers and like the government mainly realized that indigenous peoples were dependent on the bison for their livelihood. People would get their food, their shelter, uh, their clothing, their tools, pretty much everything came from the bison. So if you take away what the people are dependent on, they, be, they will become dependent on you was uh, often the thinking. So that is a big reason why the numbers of bison dropped so dramatically. And there were many other factors. And um, one that I've mentioned a little bit already is the conversion of grasslands into agricultural fields. So we're taking away their habitat. We're also taking away the keystone species for the habitat we're destroying. So together that happened really, really dramatically in less than 100 years. Um, in the late 1800s, there were a few herds that were being protected and intentionally conserved so that future generations like us would be able to see and have bison. Um, these are a few of the ones we have here at Wanuskewin. There was one herd in Montana on the Fort Peck Reservation that was started by a guy named Walking Coyote. And he had protected a few bison calves, both male and female and let them grow up and he had this herd and when he couldn't manage them anymore, he sold them to two guys, one named Pablo and one named Allard, forming the Pablo Allard herd on the Fort Peck Reservation. And uh, that herd lived there for a long time. Fort Peck had a lot of space for them until the US government said, the reser this reservation's too big, we're gonna take away some of this land for settlers. And then the, there wasn't space enough for this herd of bison to live on the land. And by that point, it was several hundred animals. So um, Pablo and Allard needed to sell their herd. The US government didn't show much interest in them. So the Canadian government actually bought these animals and moved them up to Wainwright, Alberta. Now, once in Wainwright, um, they lived there for a few years until being moved to Elk Island National Park. And the Pablo Allard herd forms the base of all of the bison in the Parks Canada system today. So the bison that you'll see in Elk Island and Prince Albert and Grasslands and Banff National Parks uh, are descendant from this Pablo Allard herd. And then one of the other main herds, there were several, but uh, one of the other main protected herds was the ones in Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone down in Wyoming and Montana. Um, it, that is one of that is the only place that bison have continued to roam without interruption since pre-contact time. So since before the arrival of Europeans, there have always been bison in what is today Yellowstone National Park. And their numbers fluctuated over time, but they were generally very well protected in Yellowstone and a looked after herd. And today there's over 4,000 animals that roam through Yellowstone National Park. Juan Escalin, 
brought back bison in December 2019. And our animals came from both of those herds. So we didn't get animals directly from Yellowstone because you can't really do that right now. But we got um, five animals that were descendant from the Yellowstone National Park herd, and we got six from Grasslands National Park. When we first started talking, seriously talking about how we would bring back bison and where we'd bring them back and where we'd get the animals from, we figured we would start with six animals from Grasslands National Park. This would prove to be a good base for our herd at Wanuskewin, and over time we would grow and maintain to around 50 animals in our park. So that is how we started. We got six animals uh, from Grasslands National Park that we welcomed back to Wanuskewin on December 7th, 2019. And then 10 days later, on December 17th, 2019, we welcomed back four cows and one bull from Yellowstone National Park. Now, how this happened was, well, we were in the works of getting our six animals and putting everything in place. Our bison manager, who was hired in August 2019, um, he heard of animals that were descended from Yellowstone that we might be able to get. And so quietly we began to work on getting them up here. And as I said, it was a perfect little miracle where we were able to start with 11 plains bison instead of six. So from grasslands, we got six eight month old um, female bison. And then from the herd descendant from Yellowstone that came from the United States, we got one bull who was four years old and four cows that were three years old and pregnant. So here you see those four cows with their babies. This photo was taken in May of this year. And um, our bison gave birth to four healthy baby bison, uh, three cows and one bull in April and May of 2020. These are the first bison born on the land at Wanuskewin in over 150 years. So this was very, very important, not only for us, um, but also for Indigenous peoples around Wanuskewin and throughout Canada. Bison um, coming back to Wanuskewin was, as I said earlier, something that we always intended to do. And it took us nearly 40 years to realize this dream, but we were able to do it eventually. And when we brought bison back, we did so in the best way we possibly could, is how we say it. So, Here's a pic picture of a couple of our little babies just after they were born. You can see three of them here. Bison are born bright orangish red and they've got their tiny little horn buds already. But um, bison are so a part, a part of Indigenous cultures because as I said before, life revolved around the bison. You could get everything you needed from the bison and so when something is that important and impacts your life in so many ways, your life starts to not necessarily revolve around it, but it becomes ingrained in many different parts of your life. So bison, um, often called buffalo, you'll hear as a part of different names. So people have buffalo as a, one of their names, maybe a last name. Um, they're a part of many different ceremonies. They're a part of stories of creation, bison are very, very important to nearly all Indigenous cultures on the plains. And so for us to welcome them back, we needed to do so in the best way possible. So we welcomed them back um, with ceremony. We held a sweat lodge ceremony um, in the day, on the day before the bison were brought back. We held a pipe ceremony the morning of to make sure that everybody um, was kind of together and rallying around the same points and uh, excited and starting the day in a good way. And then as the bison ran off of the trailers and onto the land for the first time, they were welcomed with Dakota Sundance songs, which are specific and important for bison. So bison, I've talked a lot about how they're important in Indigenous cultures today, but we also see this a lot in archaeology. So archaeology is really what started Wanuskewin, those 19 sites. We've been excavating them since 1982 and 83. We've been doing archaeology, and that does make us Canada's longest continuously running archaeological research project. But in those archaeology sites, we find 6,000 years of evidence of people hunting bison and needing bison to live. 
we find bison bones, we'll find hundreds of bison bones before we find any one bone of another animal like pronghorn or um, deer or beaver or any birds like we find bison bones way before we find those. Um, and that just tells us how important bison were. This is a very recent picture of our herd. You can see the babies are now um, not orange. They turned brown uh, around the beginning of August and they are growing quite quickly and getting very, very big. But the Opemaha Valley, we find bison bones spread throughout and it tells of the importance of bison in the lives of the indigenous peoples for thousands of years. So um, not only are they important culturally, they were important to everyday survival. Their hides provided your shelter, so it made the covers for teepees and other homes that people had. Their fur provided you with jackets and bedding and blankets. Um, their hide was also able to make your clothing and bags and drums and shields and everything. Meat provided you with food, bones, um, as I said before, were tools, but the fat from the bones, so the marrow, was very, very important to people and it was made into pemmican. You needed a lot of energy, uh, so people would eat a very high fat diet living here on the plains. Now, that is all I have to say, so I Thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them now. Katie, thank you so much for the really interesting presentation. It was really in depth. And um, I think we all understand how important bison are to the prairies. And yeah, thank you for, for taking the time to share all the information with us today. Uh, to all of our listeners, if you have um, any questions, feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And uh, Katie, if it's okay, we have a couple questions here right now. Um, sure. First question is, uh, what is the most interesting bone that you found at Wanaskewin? In most interesting bone? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hmm. I guess for archaeologists, what we find really interesting would be uh, teeth, actually. So hmm. bones, they can tell us a lot about an animal. We can sometimes figure out how old a bison is based on their bones, but teeth are really, really important. Um, one of the really cool teeth that we found was actually a canine tooth, so one of the pointy teeth, likely from a caribou. Um, and I know this isn't about bison now, but it was made into an amulet. So like a pendant that someone would have worn. The tooth um, root was grooved so that a piece of sinew could be wrapped like a cord around it and then make the necklace part so that they could wear this tooth as a pendant around their neck. So that is one really cool find, but teeth in general <laughs> can be used by archeologists to look at uh, the diets of bison and the migration patterns or movement patterns of bison in the past. So we can look at different elements that are um, stored in the teeth as they form through as they formed through life. So typically the third molar, so in us it'd be our wisdom tooth. It's the last one to form and last one to erupt in almost every animal. And so when it erupts, it's kept a pretty good record of um, what the bison's been eating through its life. And so we can look at that and look at what grasses the bison was eating, but we can also use that to look at what the environment was like because different grasses grow in different environments, cool and moist environments versus um, hot and dry environments. So teeth are always really important and interesting finds for us as archeologists. That's fascinating, I had no idea. <laughs> Um, we have a question here from a listener named Jesse. What is the maximum herd size or target herd size for Wanaskewin? So we are hoping to grow and maintain our herd as a conservation herd at around 50 animals. So we don't want to be selling our animals for meat or anything like that, um, but we'd like to keep it around 50. We're our carrying capacity, I'm sure, could be higher than that because they do have so much land, but we figure 50 is definitely a good starting point for us, and then we'll see in the future where we can go from there. And I didn't mention this before, but to make sure we've got genetic diversity in the herd and they don't wind up all being related or the same um, brothers and sisters kind of thing, we will be trading bulls in and out with other conservation herds 
um, throughout the prairies to help that genetic diversity be maintained as a conservation herd. Awesome, that's great. How are you gonna keep the herd at, at 50? Um, in the future, we'll have to figure out exactly how, what we want to do with the animals when we're at and around 50, but we may, like Grasslands does, where you help other conservation herds get started, like we got animals from Grasslands and many reserves through the province are starting by their own Plains Bison herds. Um, maybe that's an option for us, so. Awesome, thanks. Um, yeah. A listener named May would like to know um, about the health of the grassland. She's concerned that there's an overemphasis on bison, but not for the health of, of the grasslands. How will Wanaskewin ensure the health of the soil and grass? Absolutely, so we are working, um, we're working a lot with places like Ducks Unlimited, but also with the University of Saskatchewan, many different departments are involved in um, our grasslands restoration project to make sure that we are maintaining the grasslands health. So we've got their main grazer back. We're also seeing the cow birds coming back and other um, animals coming. And the grasslands took really well this first year. This is really the first year that we've seen them um, in full bloom, I guess you could say. But we will be um, doing like health assessments on the grasslands to make sure that they're not being overrun by any one species and that the soil is in good condition and um, introducing, possibly in the future, introducing other animals back to the grasslands as well here. Great answer, thanks Katie. Um, a listener named Meg would like to know how involved you have to be um, in the survival of the bison. For example, do you have to help with, um, with the births, with calving? Absolutely. Um, so we want to maintain our herd as a herd of wild bison as much as possible. So we let them stay out all winter, but we do check on them daily. We make sure that they have water because they don't have the ability to roam to a water source. So they have water bowls in all of the pen or pastures that they're in. And right now we're supplementing their feed with oats um, just to make sure that they're healthy and really going to thrive this winter and their coats are in um, good health. But as for births and other parts of um, their health like that, bison, when um, cows are about to give birth, they'll actually remove themselves from the main group of bison and go off on their own. And bison are really cool. They can actually stop labor if something comes up and they're now in danger. So if weather gets really bad or a predator comes or something, changes where they can't safely give birth to a baby, they can halt labor for a little bit and then resume later. I don't fully know how that works, but it seems pretty cool, pretty cool evolutionary adaptation. Um, and otherwise for health, we will be doing like an annual checkup on them to make sure that they are vaccinated to keep our herd disease free. Um, we will be, um, checking just their general health every year, but we're trying to leave them as wild, but keep them healthy. If that, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, I think so, as, as wild as possible. That's a great answer. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea about the halting of labor. That's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of our listeners is wondering, how often did Bison visit this place historically? Um, was bison? It, like, was it a yeah. seasonal migration? Yeah. Or were they here all year round? They likely would have been at least around the area the majority of the year. Um, bison, as I said, they don't typically migrate, but the Opimahau Valley um, provided shelter for them. So we know it was a really popular spot for people to winter camp, and that was likely at least in part because it was a popular spot for bison to be in the winter because it provided them with shelter. Um, so with bison being here most of the year, people could then be here most of the year. And one other thing that tells us about this in um, Cree culture so, or in Neheo culture, people, there's a story that goes everywhere a prairie crocus blooms, a baby bison was born. 
um, because it's the mm -hmm. umbilical cord that falls off of the baby bison when it goes into the ground, a prairie crocus blooms there. And in the springtime, our valley is covered in prairie crocuses. And so in, that tells us, I guess, that for a long time, bison really, really liked this land and came from all over. And there were many baby bison born here, which meant it was likely also a safe place for people to live. Wow, beautiful. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, a, listener, a listener named Tracy has written in, um, and not a question, but just a comment for your research that um, a, bit, a bit of information about the Juana uh, Scalin's bison origins. Part of the Allard Pablo herd actually included bison from the Bedson herd in Manitoba. And I did not know that. That's so interesting. And so um, you can look up more information about it um, at the Man it's manitobabison.ca and then click about the bison and then history of bison. Um, and I'm going to have to do that too because I, I actually, yeah. I was telling Katie before, um, I work at Grasslands and um, when I'm not with PCAP <laughs> and um, the bison we have here is from that Allard Pablo herd too. So um, yeah, really interesting. I'd like to learn more about the bed and heard. Absolutely, me too. Thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> yes. Um, a listener named Leslie um, is wondering, is there an intention or opportunity to expand the land base surrounding Wanuskewin to expand the grassland restoration and bison program? Absolutely. So that is part of what we're working on doing right now. So what I mentioned this a little bit is Juan Escalon wants to seek UNESCO World Heritage designation and we're in the process of applying and it's this massive process and we're basing it on our archaeology but to be a UNESCO site you need to show that you will be what you are um, into the future indefinitely so we need to stay as protected as possible and with that comes acquiring lands adjacent to the existing Juan Escalon Heritage Park which is um, right around 900 acres currently, we want to acquire more land to have like a buffer zone. And then likely we would work on reseeding that to native prairie grasses. So expanding that restoration project. And that is kind of what I went into about, we'll grow and maintain at 50 to start and see where things go from there. We'll see what land we have and what we're able to do in the future. That's awesome, that's great. And I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, maybe we'll give listeners another minute or so to, to type them in. I know sometimes it takes a while, especially mm -hmm. on the phone. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. While we're giving everyone a minute, Katie, um, can you tell us about your favorite part of, of your research so far? Um, for me... Or your favorite part of your job at Wanuskewin? <laughs> well, for my job at Wanuskewin, what I really like is sharing um, with people what I'm so passionate about. And especially when I first started working at the park, a lot of people hadn't been to Wanuskewin, that, like people that I knew um, in my family, my friends, they hadn't been to Wanuskewin in a really long time, if ever. And so I've been able to see people become more interested in Wanuskewin. And being able to share um, the history of the land that we live on and the fact that people have been living in the Saskatoon area for 6,000 some years a lot of people don't know. So I like being able to tell people about that and see kind of like their perspective on where they currently live change a little bit and open their eyes to that. Um, and I also absolutely yeah. love working with children and meeting people from all over the world. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's pretty my amazing. research, I guess. Yeah, my favorite part would be getting to work with the actual bones of the animals and doing the hands-on part of the research. So the faunal analysis, looking at bison bones from as far back as 4,000 years ago at the site I'm working on. Awesome. That's fabulous. Um, one of our listeners, uh, May, has written in. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the conference facilities and interpretive facilities at your site? Absolutely. So. We're just coming off the tail end of our uh, renovation and expansion and rejuvenation project. So the building, we, I think we like doubled it in size almost. We added on a um, 350 person conference center and I'm just gonna flip back in my presentation here to a picture where you can see the building. 
So um, on the right hand side here, this area is our uh, new conference center, 300, almost a 360 degree view of the Opimaha Valley. And then on the left hand side of the building is our new exhibit hall. So we are introducing new exhibits and these are being installed through the month of October. So come out in November to see the brand new exhibits and they teach about every part of life on the Northern Plains, like past and present. So we've got star knowledge. We have displays on archeology, span on bison, um, on residential schools, on art, on culture, influential indigenous peoples, everything um, through this exhibit hall area. There's also um, an elders welcome, we're calling it, and a gifts of this land exhibit where um, pieces and stories about the Wanaskewin and the Opimaha Valley through the seasons will be told. And everything is actually displayed in English and then one other Indigenous language. So we've got six languages that we rotate through throughout the park um, that SICC helped us identify. And so Cree, Dakota, um, uh, Blackfoot, Soto, I believe it's Lakota and Michif are the languages that rotate through. It's on our interpretive panels, it's in our displays. You'll be able to hear stories and hear um, the languages, hear greetings from our elders in those languages in the new building. We've also got a brand new classroom space. We um, changed our art galleries around a little bit and expanded them. Our restaurant is now different. Um, we incorporated an artist in residence space an education lab, which will do archeology span and other um, education for not necessarily school age children, but maybe higher level uh, classes out of, and yeah, a lot of uh, meeting space and conference facility as well. That's awesome. Uh, PCAP has a few events uh, every year pre-COVID <laughs> and hopefully again yeah. post-COVID <laughs> and uh, we'll definitely have to look into that facility. facility. It looks amazing and the fact that it's right by Native Prairies, is, that's usually one of our criteria so that's great to hear and, and it's so amazing that you have so many languages there. So interesting. Yeah, so yeah, Wanuskewin represents um, all those cultures on the Northern Plains. It's not just one and we really try and emphasize that we're not just one cultural group, we're all of the cultural groups on the Northern Plains. Everyone was here. Wow, that's really amazing. I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, so I guess with that, I just really want to thank you, Katie, for the really interesting presentation. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, um, thanks for tuning in. You can catch the uh, recording of this broadcast um, on the PCAP YouTube channel, and that's youtube.com slash user slash SKPCAP. Um, and then also be sure to check out the Badger presentation going on tomorrow. Um, so with that, um, and Katie, lots of listeners have actually typed in, thank you very much for the great presentation. So um, I guess with that, thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.